Good evening. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit this evening about compliance and resistance. You guys have seen the first 17 slides. What I'm going to do is add to them at this particular point. Some terms. One of them is peak inspiratory pressure or your PIP. It's measured in centimeters of water pressure. Sometimes we call it PAP, peak airway pressure. They're both the same thing. It doesn't really matter. But this is the highest pressure reached during the delivery of a breath on volume ventilation. Your peak inspiratory pressure is set in pressure ventilation. And it doesn't change. It stays that way. In volume ventilation, your peak inspiratory pressure can change with either uh, compliance or resistance. Uh, we set an alarm to prevent the volume from going too high and damaging the patient's lungs. It's determined by the equation of motion, okay? Uh, barrel trauma, we usually see it by a sudden increase in our PIP. Uh, the, de the formula for PIP is actually plateau pressure plus airway resistance. That's your looking at your lungs plus whatever uh, issues that you may have within the lungs or the thoracic cavity that's going to cause problems for you. We like to keep our PIP a little bit less than 50 to 60. However, on occasions you may see this a little bit higher, but if we have that option, that's not what we wish to do. It can result in some barrel trauma. It increases hypotension. Why does it increase hypotension? Because you're adding additional pressure in the inner thoracic cavity. So that's another reason we like to keep it less. So some of the factors that can affect your peak inspiratory pressure are your circuit. Uh, think about water in your circuit. It's going to include the flow that's coming through it. It's going to increase the pressure in there. Um, and it's also going to decrease your tidal volume, so you do have to keep an eye on that. Uh, kink circuits, sometimes the circuits when we're moving things will get um, caught between the bed rail and the, the ventilator in some cases, so we do have to be careful with those. And then high inspiratory flow rates, we're going to talk about our peak pressures here shortly. Air, artificial airway, when we look at the ET tubes, if someone has a size 6, we know there's going to be issues with that because of the small size of the lumen. A kink ET tube, sometimes our patients will do that just by turning the tube with their tongue. If they don't like the flows they're receiving, they'll sometimes bite the ET tubes. We've had patients with mucus plugs, especially if they're really dry and the mucus starts to dry out, then we'll start to see those plugs coming up our ET tubes. Cuff herniation is one, and then we also have the tube that can sit on the tracheal wall. We actually had a patient that this happened to. He had false vocal cords. As a result of that, he was actually intubated into that false vocal cords, and about every afternoon he had some problems. We couldn't get him settled down. Physician went down with the bronchoscope, and he goes, you guys should see this, and he showed us where the tube was now sitting in the false vocal cords. The patient's airway, bronchospasm, sometimes bronchoconstrictions, retained secretions will do it, um, some edema will do it, any obstruction by the foreign body uh, will do it also. The elastic recoil, that's your thoracic cage and lung involvement, any type of chest wall deformity, obesity. One of the things we need to be careful with obesity is don't lay these patients down because the abdominal cavity is going to push up on the diaphragm and you need to be able to keep that open for you. You can also see active exhalation. Exhalation should always be passive. If your patient is actively exhaling, you need to go figure out what's going on with them. Restlessness, pain, even the prone positioning will sometimes do it, especially if they're a big person and you're laying them down on their, their stomach at that particular point. A pneumothorax, fibrosis, pneumonia, different things will also affect it. Plateau pressure, sometimes called static pressure. We're going to talk about static compliance. And the question is often asked, well, how do I know you're talking about static pressure versus static compliance? If you look at the last name, you'll see that. Pressure is centimeters of water pressure. Compliance is mLs per centimeter of water pressure. Sometimes when the board is using these um, terms, they will use the static pressure. And you look, all you'll see is the centimeters of water pressure. So you know they're talking about their plateau pressure. And basically, it's really kind of simple. Plateau pressure is the amount of pressure it's taking to hold the alveoli open without any type of gas movement. What we're doing is we're doing an end 
inspiratory pause. And this pause can be anywhere from like 0 0.5 to 2 seconds. And it's going to look at the elastic recoil of the lung of the chest wall, okay? You need to make sure your patient is not trying to inhale or exhale at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to get an invalid reading at that point. And some of your events will tell you that they couldn't complete the maneuver. You're going to have to try it again. Why do we care about plateau pressure? We need to take care of plateau pressure because it helps us measure static compliance. And compliance, if you remember, is your volume over your pressure. It's a matter of how stiff are those lungs, or really how compliant those lungs are. So we need to take a look at our plateau pressure. The relationship between plateau pressure and static compliance is their inverse. If we see the plateau pressure increasing, we know the static compliance is going down. If we see the plateau pressure going down, then we know the static compliance is going up. And the higher the static compliance, the better it is, because now we can put gas in the patient's alveoli. Airy resistance is opposition to airflow by inelastic forces of the lung. And sometimes it's a majority of reasons why we see our peak inspiratory pressure increased. Uh, there's a lot more that goes on with airway resistance then goes on with plateau pressure or static compliance. The formula for this one, we're going to do it, um, is PIP minus P minus plateau minus P divided by the flow in liters per second. How do we measure airway resistance? If you look in the books, and Wilkins talks about this, we really don't measure airway resistance as airway resistance. We look at it at the difference between PIP and plateau. And that makes sense because when you're doing an inspiratory pause, you're going to stop at your peak inspiratory pressure. We're going to get rid of anything that has to do with your airway resistance. And then we're going to measure that static pressure or that plateau pressure at that particular point. The correct last name for airway resistance is centimeters of water pressure per liter per second. How do we find liters per second? Basically, you take whatever flow is being used to deliver the breath to the patient, divide by 60 seconds per minute. That will give you your liters per second. Now I'm going to show you a normal raw, and then I'm also going to tell you that a little bit later I'm going to give you a different raw, because every book has its own raw. But the normal is somewhere between 0 0.5 to 2.5, 0 0.6 to 2.6, just varies by the textbooks. When a patient is on a ventilator, though, if your raw is greater than 15 centimeters of water pressure per liter per second, your raw is way too high. And what you need to do is figure out why it is that high and then fix the problem. So here's just a little graphic of an inspiratory pause. If you can see, there's two breaths before, and then all of a sudden we put this inspiratory hold on. We sometimes call, call this a breath hold, okay? And if you look at the top of it, you can see with the inspiratory hold, they have that little dotted line section and the little arrow there before you hit plateau pressure. That's your raw, okay? So this is performed after you've delivered your tidal volume. And again, it can be between 0 0.5 to 2 seconds. We do not want the patient breathing while this is happening. The thing you need to remember you set an inspiratory pause, you have to take it off. Because what you're doing by putting that inspiratory hold on is you're lengthening eye time and decreasing E time. What is it going to happen to your patient? Basically, what's going to happen to them is they're going to sometimes end up in an inverse eye to E ratio, which is not what you're looking for. And so people sometimes will go in, they'll try to fix that inverse eye to E ratio, when the problem is not the fact that they're in that I e to E ratio, that inverse I to E ratio, because of something that's been said, it is because we have forgot to take the pause off. Okay. And this just shows you a little drawing here. Uh, you can see the peak inspiratory pressure. There's your inspiratory pause or breath hold. There's your PIP. Resistance is the difference between PIP and plateau. Folks who say, I don't remember how to remember PIP and plateau. One of the ways I try to tell folks is think about it this way. Your PIP is moving. Your PIP is the movement of getting that gas into your patient. Your plateau, think about sitting on the edge of a mountain 
and just looking at the sunset. You're not moving. You're just sitting there watching what's going on with the sunset. That's your plateau pressure. And then your resistance is what it would take for you to get from the ground point to where the plateau is. And in case you're wondering, plateau pressure is always less than PIP on patients who are intubated. In normal day-to-day -day breathing, your plateau pressure can be higher than your PIP. So increasing peak inspiratory pressure, we need to determine the cause of it. And I'm going to show you this a little bit later. And there's only really two things that can cause this plateau pressure or resistance. Plateau pressure, since it's the lungs, sometimes it causes issues. If you have somebody who has ARDS, we know the lungs are going to keep getting stiffer. We're going to have to figure out how do we take care of this patient without causing ventilator associated pneumonia, how we're going to do this without causing problems with their lungs. Uh, so it sometimes takes us a little bit longer trying to figure out how do we take care of the plateau pressure. If the patient blows a pneumothorax, all, what we're going to do is go, insert a chest tube. If we insert the chest tube, that should help us. Remember, though, if a patient has a chest tube in and they're on a ventilator, some of the tidal volume you're delivering to them is actually going to go out down through that chest tube. Resistance, for the most part, is a little bit easier to fix. If your patient has a kinked ET tube, you just need to go in there, figure out why it's kinked, and then you can flip it back. If your patient is having a problem and biting on the tube, watch and see what happens when the breaths are being delivered. If they're coming in too fast, too much pressure behind them, and that seems to be when they're going ahead and biting on the tube, then you need to decrease that flow, make it easier for that patient to receive that breath. And when we look at graphics, a lot of times we're going to see what the cause is, and I'm going to show you that here shortly. So compliance is always a change in volume divided by a change in pressure. Doesn't matter the type of compliance, it will always be delta V over delta P. Delta meaning change, and there you see it, a change in volume over a change in pressure. When we're talking about mechanical ventilation, we're looking at three different compliances. We're looking at static compliance, dynamic compliance, and tubing. With tubing, what we're looking at is to figure out how much volume are we going to be losing in the circuit. The circuit has what we call a compressibility factor. And as you're putting the gas through it, the circuit will expand. If you're standing next to a ventilator and you've never felt this, reach over when a breath is being delivered and just hold on to that circuit, and you'll actually feel it expand at that point. And because of that expansion slash compressibility factor, we're leaving volume in that circuit. And so when we're looking for it, we don't really have to do it that much on the newer, newer vents, except for like your LTV, which is still being used, that's your long-term ventilation vent, and your transport vents, you have to figure out the tubing compliance. Otherwise, you're going to rob your patient of some tidal volume. So what we do is we're going to go and take our vents. We clean our vents. Once they've been cleaned, we go ahead and put a new circuit on them. Once we have a new circuit on them, we're going to hook them up the way they need to be hooked up, take all the peep off, uh, set a tidal volume of about 200 mLs, set a respiratory rate of 12. You're going to take the high pressure limit and set it at 120 centimeters of water pressure. And you're going to take your peak inspiratory flow and put it at 40 um, liters per minute. And then what you do is you just go ahead with your gloved hand and you occlude the end of the circuit. And when you do that, you're going to watch and see where the pressure goes. And you're going to also see what volume you're getting back. And so once you've done that, you can then say, okay, this is how much volume I'm getting back. I have my tidal volume set at 200, but I'm only getting 180 back. And it's taking me, because my high pressure is set at 120, it's taking me 110 centimeters of water pressure to deliver that, prop, that volume through the circuit. And so you're going to take whatever tidal volume you have, which is the 180, and divide it by the pressure of 110, and that will give you what we call tubing compliance. Please do not call this dead space. It is the volume of the tidal volume lost in the circuit. So there again, it's performed on our old, older ventilators, the newer transport ventilators, and the LTVs. 
you have to do this before you place the patient on the ventilator. And as you can see, there is the center, the uh, guidance for doing it, the settings and the guidance. And then you can read the pressure off your manometer, and then you'll get your exhale tidal volume. Okay. Exhale volume can be higher or lower than the set tidal volume. Uh, the loss volume is lost by the pressure used to deliver the breath. Also, sometimes what happens is if the breath is going in fairly rapidly, the volume is not going to the patient. It's being dumped down the expiratory limb. And so sometimes we'll end up with higher exhaled volumes than we did prior to it. And it's, that's the, re the cause of it at that point. Most of your newer ventilators had their algor algorithms built into them. Using these alg algorithms, they determine the tubing compliance. You're going to do what's called a short self-test, or SST. That SST is going to check and tell you what the tubing compliance is. With the Puritan Bennett 840, with the Puritan Bennett 980, uh, what they do with it, this is they have the compliance. And then when you're ready to set the vent up at that particular point, you have to dial in the patient, male, female, ideal body weight, whatever. And the ventilator uses the ideal body weight to determine how much of that volume is going to be placed back with the patient. So learn, figuring out tubing compliance without PEEP. And like I said, once we've cleaned the vent, put those circuits on and things like that, we're not going to add PEEP, OK? So what we're going to do is say, for example, we include the volume. We've actually set 200 mLs. We set our high pressure at 120. In this case, we're doing the procedure. Once we do the procedure, we notice we're getting back 200 mLs. And the occluded pressure off the manometer is reading 110 centimeters of water pressure. Formula for compliance, change in volume over change in pressure. 200 divided by 110 gives you a tubing compliance of 1.82 mLs per centimeter of water pressure. Translated into mechanical ventilation. For every breath delivered, depending on the peak inspiratory pressure the patient has, 1.82 mLs will be left in the circuit for every centimeter of water pressure it's going to be used to deliver the tidal volume. Okay? And so the question comes up, well, why is this important? This is important because if we were not to put that volume back in some cases, your patient would become very air hungry. They would be very unhappy on the ventilator. We're going to get a lot of patient ventilator dyssynchrony, and they can start crashing on you. So you always want to be aware of this. And like I said, we'll see this with our transport vents, and we also see them with the LTV. So here's the rest of the example. We went ahead and did the tubing compliance. A lot of times with your vents, what you do is once you've cleaned them, you've done the SST, you can write on a piece of paper the day it was cleaned, who did it, uh, what the compliance was, any th other things that your hospital would like you to put on it. And then when you're ready to set it up, you just go get the ventilator, you bring it in, and just in case you're wondering, I don't want to do an SST, you know, I don't know how to do it, I'm really scared, I think the vent's going to blow up on me. If you type in new patient without doing an SST between patients, the ventilator will not do anything for you, okay? So just be aware of that. So we're going to place this patient on a ventilator, so we're going to go ahead and set up the ventilator. And when we talk about setting up the ventilator, we're going to look at what are, what are the physician's orders. They're going to tell us the type of ventilation. Do they want pressure or volume? What tidal volume? What respiratory rate? What FiO2? What PEEP do we need? And once we have those, most of the other controls are up for us to set. So we look at the manometer, and we're noticing the average pressure used to deliver the breath is 35 centimeters of water pressure. So now we're kind of curious as what is the tidal volume this patient would be receiving if the machine did not add any tidal volume back? So the formula for the first part is your PIP times your tubing compliance gives you the lost volume. So in this case, you have a PIP of 35 centimeters of water pressure, a tubing compliance of 1.82 mLs per centimeter water pressure, and you're losing approximately 64 mLs in the circuit. Okay. So now the question comes up, so what? 
The formula now is what we're going to find is called corrected tidal volume, and this would be the volume the patient is receiving. So we take whatever the set tidal volume is. In this case, your orders are 500 mLs. We're going to subtract that 63.7 or 64 mLs that's lost in the circuit, and we're going to come up with a corrected tidal volume the patient is receiving. And in this case, it's 436.3 probably right around 436 mLs at this point. If your patient is happy with that and your physician is happy with that, we may just leave it alone. If your phys physician is trying to control the PaCO2 and we need that 63 uh, uh, mLs of lost volume, then we're going to put it back because we need to use that to be able to fix the PaO2, PaCO2. So achieving compliance with PEEP, and remember PEEP is always an artificially elevated baseline. It's going to be the new baseline. Remember the threshold resistor is holding the PEEP when the patient exhales, and it helps to split those airways open. It's there to improve our oxygenation, improve our FRC, decrease the work of breathing. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, we know what the tubing compliance is. It's 1.82 mLs per centimeter water pressure. That set tidal volume is 500 mLs, and we have 5 peak. So we look at our manometer, and my peak inspiratory pressure is 45 centimeters of water pressure. So in order to find the volume the patient is receiving, what I'm going to do is take that PEEP and subtract it from your peak inspiratory pressure, and then I'm going to go ahead and multiply that by the tubing compliance. So in this case, 45 minus 5 is 40. 40 times the 1.82 tells me that I'm losing approximately 73 mLs of tidal volume for every breath. Using your set tidal volume, the corrected tidal volume is going to be 500 minus that 73, and now we're only delivering 427 mLs to that patient. And that patient may be feeling very air hungry, at which point in time we're probably going to have to add that volume back in. And how do we add it? Well, the set tidal volume is 500. I'm losing 73 approximately, and I'm going to reset my tidal volume, in this case probably for 575. Because a lot of times you don't do the 2.8, 3.8, things like that. Okay, so we're going to take a look at tubing compliance with a patient who is auto peep. Remember, auto peep is caused by air trapping because we're unable to emit and get all the gas out because the alveoli could be collapsing on themselves. It could be too high of a minute ventilation. It could also be an almost, if not, inverse IDE ratio. We still have the same tidal uh, tubing compliance, 1.82 mLs per centimeter water pressure. We still have set the tidal volume at 500 mLs, and we even have set or extrinsic PEEP at 5 centimeters of water pressure. We notice from looking at the manometer that the patient has auto peep of three. We can also measure auto peep by doing an expiratory hold. In this case, then we look at our PIP. Our PIP is now 56 centimeters of water pressure. We're going to add our PEEP and our auto peep. Five plus three gives me eight centimeters of water pressure. The formula again is your PIP minus your PEEP times your tubing compliance. 56 minus 8 equals 48 times 1.82, which means we're now losing 87 milliliters of volume in the circuit. To find out what the patient's going to receive, the corrected tidal volume is 500 minus that 87, and your patient is only getting right around 413, maybe 414. That's way too little for this patient and it's going to cause some dyssynchrony on the part of the patient. So why did we do this? Well, we needed to because the, to, we needed to make sure that we delivered the correct tidal volume to this patient. And so a lot of times we could talk to the physicians and say, here's your tubing compliance. This is how much you're losing based on the settings we have. Um, do you want us to go ahead and add this back, or are you happy with it? And if it was just a minor one, there was no problem with it. If it was a big one, then definitely they wanted it back at that point. Okay. 
And because of the changes in the PIP, sometimes we couldn't guarantee what tidal volume pa these patients are gonna have because if the PIP increases, we're gonna lose more. If the PIP decreases, we're gonna gain more. We don't do this throughout the time the patient is on the ventilator. We normally do it probably right when we put the patient on the ventilator or shortly thereafter, and then we just go with it. So really there's not any difference today. As I told you, uh, the transport vents, the LTV, or some exceptions with this. You have to know what the set tidal volume is. You have to know what your compliance is. Your tubing compliance especially, you need to be able to add flow back into that system so that your patient doesn't have problems. And we see patient ventilator dyssynchrony, or we see the patient beginning to collapse. And that was your assignment. So other compliances, there's two other compliances we measure. One is dynamic, and that's your C-dyne, and static compliance, which is C-stat. Dynamic compliance, this is the total impedance to gas flow into the lungs. It's a moving compliance, if you want to think about it that way. The formula is going to be your corrected tidal volume divided by your PIP minus P. And the corrected tidal volume is either going to be your delivered or corrected that we figured out. Most often on the newer ventilators, we use the exhaled tidal volume because that is really the delivered tidal volume. And if you think about it, it's also the corrected tidal volume. Again, you can see PEEP has to be removed. Uh, when we're doing this, we're looking at both the flow restrictive characteristics of the airways and the elastic components of the lung and the chest wall. Static compliance is sometimes called respiratory system compliance or effective static compliance, okay? It's still a lung volume change divided by the pressure during the period of no gas flow. It looks as a combination of the chest wall and lung compliance. And the formula is corrected tidal volume divided by plateau minus P. And again, corrected tidal volume most time we're using it now is the exhaled tidal volume. And when they're telling you when you do this, you want to look at least three breaths and then go ahead and do it. You want to make sure that the patient is getting what they need. One of the things, too, that you, we're going to mention really quickly is auto flow. Auto flow is on your Draeger ventilators, and they use three bit breaths of the patient to determine auto flow. So three seems like a pretty good number. Normal values for static compliance off of vent, 60 to 100 mLs per centimeter water pressure. Normal ventilator values, somewhere between 40 to 60. You may see some different ones in the book. Um, anything less than 15 mLs per centimeter water pressure on a static compliance tells you these lungs are extremely stiff and we're gonna have problems ventilating them. We're not gonna be able to get, <clears throat> excuse me, a volume in. And we have to be careful so that we don't cause any lung injuries. Anything less than 20 to 25 uh, mLs per centimeter of water pressure will make your weaning more difficult and also have cause a problem when you're withdrawing the patient from the feet. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, plateau pressure, static compliance, inverse relationship. One goes up, we know the other's going down. Before opposition to airflow by the inelastic forces of the lung, a very reliable estimate is your PIP minus plateau divided by your flow in liters per second. Uh, you still got to get the PEEP out of there because PEEP is that artificial baseline. When you're measuring this, we have two waveforms. We have the square wave, and then we also have the decelerating. We want the patient to be in the square waveform. Um, and we cannot have the patient actively inhaling when we're doing this. Typical range anywhere, as I mentioned before, 0 0.6 to 2.6. Uh, depending on your textbook, Wilkins uses like one to three centimeters of water pressure per liters per second. Vegans has one to two. So it's just a matter of what the textbooks start, talk about. But if you notice, there's not much. If your raw is greater than 15 centimeters of water pressure per liter per second, it's a cause for concern.
So we can look at the waveform graphics to help us find why is your PIP going up. And in this case, you can see on the top one that the raw is staying the same, but the peak inspiratory pressure is going up. As that peak inspiratory pressure is going up, if the raw is staying the same, then the problem is your plateau pressure or your static compliance. On the bottom one, your raw was increasing and your plateau basically stayed the same. In this case, the increased peak inspiratory pressure came from an increased raw. The thing you need to remember is both of these can contribute to it. It's not an either or case. So just to show you a little bit, you can also do it this way. Uh, this is a little table that shows you at eight o'clock in the morning, we did a vent check at 8, 10, 12, and 1400. The peak inspiratory pressure started at 25. At 1400, it had climbed up to 64 centimeters of water pressure. The plateau pressure started about 20 at 0800, and it had climbed to 57 centimeters of water pressure by 1400. The PEEP went 0, 5, 10, and 12. The raw, the difference between the PIP and plateau started at 5, and at 1400 ended up at 7. And the tidal volume stayed the same, it was still 500 mLs. An easy way of doing this is take your 1400 measurement, subtract the 8, 0, 0800 measurement, 64 minus 25 tells me my PIP went up by 39 centimeters of water pressure. My plat, I'm going to take my 57, which was my ending value at 1400, subtract my 0, 0800, which is 20. My plateau went up by 37 centimeters of water pressure. And when I look at my raw, I started at 5, ended up at 7, at 1400, and 7 minus 5 is only 2. If you remember the formula, PIP is equal to plat plus raw. 39 is equal to this case of 37 plus 2. What's the major problem here? That 37, and that 37 tells us the lungs are getting stiffer, stiffer at this particular point. So writing it all out here, the PIP is increased by 39, the plateau is increased by 37, the raw difference is increased by 2. So what caused the PIP to increase? It doesn't increase by itself, it has to have something doing it. And looking at the formula again, PIP is equal to plat plus raw. 37 plus 2 gives you 39, so the problem is the plateau. Okay, so what we want to look at is when are we going to call the physician? What level of PEEP and plateau level are going to cause us the greatest concern? And according to the books, we want to keep this plateau pressure less than 30 centimeters of water pressure. Egan's has come out to about 28 centimeters of water pressure, which is still less than 30. When we go ahead and we take the plateau pressure at 20, when it was at 27 minus 5, the absolute plateau pressure was only 22. When we went to 40 and added 10 a peep, and it gave us the 40, that plateau pressure went up to 30. And because the plateau pressure is greater than 30 now, we need to be talking to our physician. One thing we want to always remember though, look at this patient. Does this patient need to be suctioned? Although it's resistance, Still, sometimes it does affect our plateau pressure. Is the patient sitting with his knees and his chin and his, you know, legs dangling off the bed or something where they don't need to be? Make sure your patient is breathing appropriately and then we're not going to have problems with that. So then the question is, well, what about the raw? When is the raw going to be the problem? And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to do another study in this case. And we're doing one at 8, 10, 12, and 14. We started off with a PIP of 22 centimeters of water pressure. My plateau was 18. No PEEP in my raw, then it was 4. At 10, 100, the PIP went to 29. I added 5 a PEEP, but my plateau only went up by 3. It went from 18 to 21. My raw went up by eight, uh, 4 because now I'm at 8. 
at 1200, my PIP now is 38. My PIP has been increased to seven. My plateau did not go up by that much. It only went to 25. But look at your raw. Your raw has gone from eight to 13. At 1400, the PIP is 50. The plateau is 26. The PIP is at 10. We're sitting there going, this is not too bad with the plateau, but my raw now is gone up by 24. And so if I do my math at 1400 minus 800 for the PIP, 50 minus 22 is 28. So my peak inspiratory pressure has gone up by 28 centimeters of water pressure. During the same time period, my plateau only went to 26, and 26 minus 18 is 8. So my plateau pressure only increased by 8. My raw started at 4 and ended up with 24, and 24 minus 4 is 20. Okay, so my raw now is 20 centimeters of water pressure per liter per second. Using your formula of PIP is equal to plat plus raw, 28 is equal to 8 plus 20. What's the larger value? The larger value is raw. The problem is something with resistance. And so we see the same thing. This is written out the same way. You can see the increase of your PIP, increase of your plateau, which is not that much, the increase in the raw, and then we can go ahead and then figure out what is by airway resistance. Where we sometimes see this, and this is something you always want to keep in mind, your patient will sometimes have increased secretions. And unfortunately, sometimes when they're coughing, and they're coughing because of these secretions, people have a tendency to want to go in and suction them down the ET tube or the trach tube. If you look at the patient and you see these secretions coming out of their mouth, the problem right then is not their lungs. The problem is the secretions in the airway. And what you need to do is take your young cower and go ahead and clean the mouth out, and clean that airway out. Get that patient to relax, be able to breathe much better. And a lot of times that will take care of your airway resistance. So what is the actual formula then for airway resistance? Again, hip minus plateau divided by the flow of liters per second. If your flow is 60 liters per minute, we're going to take that 60 liters per minute divided by 60 seconds per minute. And so your flow is one liter per minute, which is really cool because now you can figure out what is your actual raw. And in this case, we did the 22 minus 18, which is 4, divided by 1 is 4. And you can see the 8, same thing. So the raw is the same either way that you measured it. So then what is the static compliance? In this case, what we did is we're going to look at the plateau, we're going to look at the PEEP, and then we're going to look at our tidal volume. And in this case, we're going to say for some reason the exhale tidal volume is 500, okay? So what we're going to do is take the plateau and the tidal volume. The tidal volume is 500 divided by 20 because there's no PEEP, and the static compliance is 25 mLs per centimeter water pressure. Not bad, fairly decent. On the second one, we actually added 5 a peep. My plateau is now 27. 500 divided by 27 minus 5 is 22. And now my static compliance is 22.72. And as a result of that, my static compliance is going down. At C, which is 1,200, my tidal volume is still 500. My plateau is 40. My peep is 10. 500 divided by 30 now gives me a static compliance of 16.67 mLs per centimeter water pressure. And then at 1400, we went ahead and looked at it, the 500, this time divided by the 57 minus 12, which is 45. And now my static compliance is 11.11 .11 mLs per centimeter water pressure. We have really exceeded that because remember the lowest we want to go with this if we can handle it is no less than 15 mLs per centimeter water pressure. So now we need to take a look and try to figure out what's going on with this patient and their lungs. 
So this is your work assignment. And what I did is I've given you some different exhale title volumes. And I want you to use those to figure out what your static compliance is on these. Tell me which one is your best, which one is your worst. And then when would you call your physician?